Good morning. Um, well, I'm Jane, and I'm the founder and CEO of a socially inspired business called To The Market, which uses artists and enterprise to help empower economically survivors of abuse, conflict, and disease. And this morning, I wanted to briefly talk about a country about which I feel very passionately, Nepal. I've had the pleasure of actually working with Nepal from three different lenses, one from the government um, when I was at the State Department, um, one from the not-for-profit sector, and one from actually the for-profit sector. But before we begin, I'm actually going to ask everybody to sort of do a little exercise with me. Um, so just indulge me. Um, I want everybody to sort of imagine uh, that the Bay Area has experienced an earthquake. And it's a substantial earthquake, and it's led to significant damage. This means that access to clean water, food, and shelter are all compromised. But fortunately, some famous musicians are doing a concert, and they're going to raise some money to help uh, address the disaster. Um, and, and slowly, aid from out of state begins to pour in. And at first, among the community, this is really welcomed. Um, we're really happy to have assistance, access to that clean water, access to the food, access to shelter. Um, but then suddenly we begin to see that some of these organizations are, are making demands about what they think rebuilding should look like, what they think our homes should look like, what they think our roads should look like. And despite plenty of local labor and, and high unemployment among the population because of the destruction, it seems like there are a lot of out-of-state workers that are coming in to actually do this work for us. And then uh, just sort of as time goes on, some of the mom and pop stores begin to reopen up, but they're really struggling because the things that they're selling are being given away or se severely subsidized by out-of-state partners. And then as local officials begin to sort of interact with their constituents and say to them, you know, what can I do? How can I help? They actually find that there have been folks from other states or, or other areas that have actually been on the ground doing work really without even extending a hand to partner, um, severely undermining the authority of these, of, of these uh, officials. And slowly, as the press coverage begins to dissipate and uh, the donations begin to slow, uh, a number of really sort of half-baked projects are left behind. And because they weren't properly partnered with the community, people don't really even know what, what the intention of, with, of was of the project or, or what, um, what the direction of the project is supposed to be. Um, and there we are. So I know that this seems like a really extreme example, uh, especially being in a developed country, but it's actually not a far cry for, from what happens at times when there is a disaster and outside assistance comes to the aid of a community um, and doesn't really think about how to assist that community in a meaningful and a sustainable way. So today I wanna talk really briefly about Nepal. Um, and I just want to talk about what happened in Nepal. I want to reference um, Haiti because that was also uh, a country that was devastated by an earthquake um, that had some things that were great that happened and some things that we, we would really want to avoid. Um, and then I just want to talk about really three opportunities for Nepal in this, in this reconstruction. So let's start with looking at Nepal. So Nepal, um, in April 2015, uh, experienced an earthquake and then several aftershocks and then another major earthquake in May that led to uh, the largest humanitarian disaster within the country for o over 80 years. Um, and just to sort of throw some numbers on the board, um, tens of thousands were killed or injured, 2.8 million were displaced, 473,000 homes were destroyed, and more than a million folks were in need of food assistance. Now, I know that that looks like a snapshot of the destruction, but I want us to also think about how that's a snapshot of the opportunity. So let's look at Haiti really quickly. So Haiti. Um, 
although it was sort of lower on the Richter scale, this actually had even more devastation in Haiti. Um, the number of people killed was close to uh, just over 200,000. A uh, number of people, over 300,000, um, which you can imagine anywhere is pretty devastating, but in a country that small is, is really significant. Um, but maybe what's sort of the most staggering thing about uh, post-earthquake uh, was the fact that $13.5 billion were pledged or donated for reconstruction. And despite what seems like incredible, overwhelming generosity, um, there have been some missteps in the reconstruction um, that I'm going to point to really quickly because I think it helps lead into talking about the opportunities for reconstruction in Nepal. So um, pitfalls. One thing that um, seemed to be uh, somewhat prevalent was essentially the outsourcing of work. So I'm going to read uh, a quote from uh, a man that is from, um, from the Center for Economic Policy and Research. Um, and this is in no way to um, sort of put down the efforts of USAID, um, but it seems like this is a statistic that's really worth us taking a look at. Um, so Jake Johnson uh, says, uh, USAID has spent about $1.5 billion since the earthquake in Haiti. Less than a penny of every dollar goes directly to a Haitian organization. So that's, that's a pretty significant contrast. Um, the second thing I would point to was, um, besides not sufficiently empowering the local community, was really looking at the outsourcing of work. So again, from the same study that Jake did, he said international companies had to fly in, rent cars, rent hotels, and spend allowances for food and cost of living expenses. Danger pay and hardship pay inflated salaries by more than 50%. So you can imagine what type of ROI we were getting here um, on many of this work. And then from a private sector standpoint, um, because I think we've sort of touched on, on maybe the challenges of the not-for-profit and the government response, um, there were, again, a number of, I would say, very limited sourcing efforts that were done. Designers were pulling um, raw material to incorporate into a collection for a season um, in, in order to benefit uh, the country. But unfortunately, um, these were literally collections, meaning that they were of a limited run um, and they weren't sustainable efforts. And so after several years, these really sort of died out. So how can we take those lessons learned and um, have sort of the opposite impact in Nepal? So one of the things that um, I think is really um, exciting about um, where Nepal is and, and really in any sort of uh, post-disaster is that there really is a tremendous opportunity for leadership in action. And just a mini case study, I want to point to a really terrific organization of, uh, in which I'm involved called Women Lead. And Women Lead is an adolescent girls leadership academy in Kathmandu, although it pulls girls from all around the Kathmandu Valley. And essentially the girls apply and then are accepted into a, a year-long leadership academy um, that really takes a deep dive into leadership principles and also civic activism. So after the earthquake, the women leaders, as we call them, um, instinctively, because they had been trained as leaders, began delivering things like blankets, sanitary pads, school supplies, books, stationery to those in the community. And some of the women um, who are from the Outer Valley area were even trekking to remote villages and were often the first responders on the scene. And so to me, this is a terrific example of how one can direct assistance to local organizations, even if they weren't built for reconstruction or, or designed for humanitarian response. If, if there are organizations that are equipped to do this type of work, then when we are empowering them, whether we are um, providing financial support or other types of resources, we are saying we believe in you and we know that you know what is best. So another quick opportunity um, is thinking about job creation. 
Um, as I noted, there were a number of foreign workers that came into Haiti, and I think that there's an opportunity um, to really try to mitigate that. And so um, one sort of example I like to talk about is, um, is global, global Communities, which is an incredible nonprofit um, that has been participating in Nepal's reconstruction efforts. And something that I loved, which is so core to Global Communities, that Global Communities did in Nepal, is that when they, um, when they arrived, um, they immediately partnered with a Nepali organization called HELP, um, and they started hiring local staff and local workers. And I think that this approach sounds so simple, but yet so oftentimes it really hasn't been pursued. And I think the, the advantage of hiring these local workers is that of course it's a higher return on investment when you compare the salaries, the travel expenses of having to, to fly in outsiders, but it also creates income for the community and maybe even more importantly than that income because you're paying locals gets recirculated within the local economy. And that's really crucial. And similarly, within the global communities example of reconstruction, they were also sourcing rebuilding materials locally, which is so important for the local businesses to have that opportunity. So oftentimes uh, in aid, uh, aid dynamics, when we bring in outside material, we are severely undermining the local business persons who, who might be a farmer who are selling, uh, selling their crops, but you know, they can't, you know, they can't even get market dollar for their crop because somebody is severely subsidizing the sale of that crop um, from an outside organization that maybe is a not for profit. So I really like the idea that there's an opportunity for job creation in addition to really allowing folks to, to take leadership from the classroom and into the field. And then the last opportunity I would focus on in, in, in Nepal, and, and really, again, in any sort of um, post-disaster um, context, is there is an opportunity for targeted trade. And what do I mean by targeted trade? Um, as, I, as I referenced in Haiti, um, you know, there were these sort of limited opportunities for pri the private sector to source material, um, to make donations, uh, in exchange for um, you know, certain arrangements, but, but they were very limited and they weren't sustainable and, and they would, they would uh, be what I would describe as a pity purchase. Um, and I think in the case of Nepal, I, I would point to the company that, that I run to the market. Um, we have had a growing need for selling scarves. And um, there is an organization, these are the ladies in the organization called Unako, which means hers, in Nepali that has been creating scarves, like the one I'm wearing. And what's interesting about the scarves is that, you know, all things equal, it's not that I couldn't find the scarf anywhere else, but I actually had a need for scarves and I'd simply directed where I was getting those scarves from a community that I felt like was in particular um, need of economic empowerment. So to me, those are three terrific opportunities in any sort of post-disaster, post-reconstruction um, community where we can look at how we can apply leadership in action, how we can create um, uh, targeted trade, and how we can create jobs from the disaster and ultimately empower the local community to lead their own reconstruction. Thank you.